Our topic tonight, though, as you know, is one of the pithiest uh, comments, uh, titles we've had. Um, can China rise peacefully? With a lot of thoughts about what that rise means and what, it's, how, what the complications are over a period of time and uh, whether it can be done uh, gracefully or not. And as you all know, many people feel that our policy since the 1970s has been largely one of accommodation toward China with variants uh, on either side in terms of intensity. But nevertheless, that's been a, 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 a general view. Uh, but of course, the question of what happens when China really becomes powerful and uh, what its behaviors will be has been an ongoing question for decades. And it's sharpened in today's world uh, simply because the rising is apparent and uh, some of the problems which flow from it, like our uh, uh, discussions or, or disputes of the last few days over uh, ownership of islands uh, within the South China Sea and elsewhere, uh, are with us. So the topic is, is of pressing importance today. Professor Mersheimer has been covering this or written about it I, at least for seven years, I think, and probably thought about it a lot longer than that. And, uh, so he's given it a lot of thought, he's written about it, and we're absolutely delighted that uh, he's willing to share his thinking with us on the question of can China rise peacefully. And parenthetically, let me say, I'd like to limit the questions tonight to China, of course, that's why we're all here. And uh, we, we've had some friends who have suggested there are other things to talk about, but that's our agreed upon topic for this, this evening. Uh, Professor Mersheimer is a uh, graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, his PhD is from Cornell. He's uh, uh, done postgraduate work at Harvard's Kennedy School. He's been a member of the University of Chicago faculty since 1982. Uh, he's had a distinguished career there. Uh, his books are several. Uh, the first was on conventional uh, deterrence. And then a book on Little Heart and the, the Weight of, of History, which is probably a less well-known book to many of you, but of course a very great uh, uh, English uh, strategist. And his book on the tragedy of uh, great power politics uh, is striking as a uh, uh, articulation of a theme within the realist school of, of thought. Uh, he's also written a book uh, uh, the Israel Lobby and American Foreign Policy, published in 2007. And uh, more recently, Why Leaders Lie. Uh, the, the, the truth about uh, uh, lying in international <laughs> relations. Um, the, the articles that he has written cover so many interesting themes. You, you, I certainly will not mention all of them, but I thought he did very interesting articles on why we should not go into Iraq uh, at least two years or in that period of about two years prior to our actually going in. And uh, uh, most interesting, he's written on a lot of contemporary events. Uh, he's been on the editorial board of a dozen scholarly journals, which is uh, very striking. And it's written for popular works uh, as well, such as Newsweek. Uh, so in short, the, the, the things that have concerned him have covered the range of international issues. Um, I should note, just parenthetically sort of, that at Cornell he won an award as a, a pre-doctoral uh, uh, teacher uh, for excellence in teaching. And he's gotten one of the outstanding awards at the University of Chicago for that. Uh, I also noticed that he, he was uh, asked to give uh, uh, addresses to graduating classes at the University of Chicago, undergraduate classes. The Phi Beta Kappa Society uh, gave him a visiting fellowship, uh, visiting professor fellowship, which took him to uh, eight different colleges and universities talking about a variety of matters within the, uh, that era. Uh, I would also note that he was on a, and this sounds like academic things to a small degree, but he was on the committee for the selection of the president of the University of Chicago, which shows a great deal of respect from the administration and his colleagues at that particular uh, institution. Uh, 
Um, we're absolutely delighted to have one of the nation's foremost uh, theorists about international politics join us to talk about a pressing issue which is going to be with us a long time. It's central in our foreign policy. Can China rise peacefully? It's an enormous pleasure to present <coughs> Professor John J. Mersheimer. Thank you very much for the kind invitation, Frank. Thank you very much for inviting me to come here this evening to speak. And thanks to all of you for coming out to listen to me talk. The subject, as you all know, is can China rise peacefully? And my basic answer is no. Uh, that if China continues to grow economically uh, and becomes much more powerful, than it is today, there'll be big trouble ahead. Now, before I explain to you why I think that's the case, I want to make two sets of preliminary remarks. First of all, I am simply assuming that China will continue to grow. It's not for certain. I've been to China a number of times, and there are a number of very thoughtful and smart Chinese who I've talked to who do not believe that China will continue to grow in a way that it'll be uh, a real gorilla in Asia. Uh, there are lots of other people who think exactly the opposite. But the key point you want to keep in mind is I am simply assuming that China is going to turn into a giant Hong Kong and then asking the question, what are the consequences? And of course, we're talking really about 20, 30 years down the road. Because today, China, in many ways, is just a paper tiger. Lots of people think that China is already this great power that's ready to challenge the United States. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're talking 20, 30 years down the road. And again, I'm assuming that China will continue to grow economically. The second point is that how you think about the question on the table is largely a function of theory. And the reason that it's a theoretical question is because we have no facts about the future. If you hear somebody say, I was in Beijing last week, I talked to person X, Y, and Z, and after those conversations, I have concluded that China can rise peacefully, you should dismiss those comments out of hand because they're meaningless. The person that he or she was talking to is probably going to be dead in 20 or 30 years, and the people who are going to be running China are probably in first grade or fifth grade now. And who knows who they're going to be? in terms of running the ship of state. And furthermore, given the circumstances that they will be in then, which are very different from the circumstances that China is in now, who knows how they will think? So it is, in very important ways, a theoretical question. You have to have a theory. That brings me to my talk. My talk has three parts to it. First, as you would expect, I'm going to lay out for you in very simple terms my theory of international politics. I'm going to tell you how I think the world works when it comes to great powers, especially rising great powers. Then the second thing I'm going to do is give you a synoptic version of how I think about the history of American foreign policy from 1783 when the country was created up to the present. I'm going to talk about the history of American foreign policy. And of course, what I'm going to try and do is tie my discussion of American history to my theory to give you some sense of confidence that my theory is correct. <laughs> then I'm going to shift gears, and I'm going to go to the third part of my talk. And the argument I'm going to make there is that China is going to behave like the United States. And the United States will respond to China much the way the United States has always responded to rising great powers. And China will respond, and America will respond in ways that are consistent with my theory. Right? So the first thing I have to do is lay out this theory for you, number one. Then number two, talk about the history of American foreign policy. And then three, talk about what China will do and how the Americans will respond. So that's the basic framework for the talk. OK, let me start with my theory. My theory is based on five simple assumptions about the world. The first is that states are the principal actors 
in the international system, and there is no higher authority that sits above states. In social science speak or international relations speak, we call this anarchy. Anarchy to most of you means murder and mayhem. But in the world of social science, it doesn't mean murder and mayhem. It means the opposite of hierarchy. There is no higher authority that sits above states. You all know the United Nations has hardly any power, the League of Nations, we know the story there. There is no institution, no organization, no political entity that sits above states. The system is comprised of states that look like a bunch of pool balls on a table. Those pool balls, of course, are of different size. But the system is anarchic, it's not hierarchic. That's assumption one. Assumption two is that all of those states have some offensive military capability. Some have more than others. A country like the United States of America, a country like Britain, a country like Israel, these are countries with a lot of offensive capability. But the fact is that even countries like Belgium, countries like Egypt, they have some, however limited, offensive military capability. Okay? Now, the third assumption is of enormous importance for my story. The third assumption has to do with intentions. And my argument is you can never know the intentions of other states. You can never be certain whether another state has benign or malign intentions towards you. And the principal reason for that when you're talking about the present is that intentions are very hard to measure because they're inside people's heads. Go back to the second assumption, which is about capabilities. Capabilities involve material things. In the Cold War, we could count how many armored division equivalents, how many SS-18s, how many submarines the Soviet Union had, and they could do the same thing with us. We had a pretty good sense of what the balance of power looked like. But we were never certain about Soviet intentions. Just couldn't figure them out because we couldn't get inside people's heads. We still are not sure what German intentions were before World War I. We still have huge debates on this. We know what their capabilities were. We knew what their capabilities were at the time. But intentions are very hard to discern. Now, if you don't agree with me on that, and you say, John, I think looking out at China today or the Chinese looking at the Americans today, it's pretty easy for them to figure out what the other is thinking. We can pretty well gauge intentions today. My response to that, which is my Sunday punch, is, okay, I'll give you that, but you can't tell me about future intentions. You can't tell me what China's intentions will be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Let me give you an example to drive this home. It's got nothing to do with international relations, and it's actually a rather depressing example, but it illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. Marriage. When any two people get married, in almost all cases, they assume that the person they're marrying has wonderful intentions toward them. Right? Otherwise, they wouldn't get married, one would hope. But the fact is we have close to a 50% divorce rate in the United States. This tells me that any time any two people get married, there's no way they can be certain that the person they're marrying won't, for one reason or another, turn into Attila the Hunt. <laughs> that you won't end up in a War of the Roses-like situation. Now, I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying that that is going to happen. My point is, you cannot be certain. You cannot be 100% certain that it won't happen. So my first three assumptions are, number one, there's no higher authority that sits above states. States are the key actors in the system. They're like pool balls. Second assumption, each one of those pool balls, each one of those states has some offensive capability. Number three is with regard to intentions. You can never be certain about the intentions of other states.
Number four and five are very simple. The fourth assumption is that the principal goal of states is to survive. And the reason is very simple. If you don't survive, you can't pursue any other goal. Survival always has to be the bedrock assumption because survival is essential to be able to pursue all of those other goals. And then the fifth assumption is that states are rational actors. They're basically strategic calculators. They're actually quite good in figuring out the best ways to survive in the international system. Okay, those are my five starting assumptions. We take them, we put them in the blender, and we hit the on switch. And we get three kinds of behavior. These are the behaviors that dominate when you're talking about great powers. First is that great powers fear each other. Why do they fear each other? They fear each other because you're always worried that your next door neighbor or somebody in the neighborhood might have a lot of offensive capability and malign intentions. There's no way if you're living in Germany's neighborhood from 1870 forward that you don't get very nervous about the fact that you're living next door to this state that has a lot of offensive capability and intentions that are hard to discern now and certainly in the future. The Israelis creating a Palestinian state, not an open and shut case for them, given what I just said. Think about that. If you're the Israelis, you're thinking about creating a Palestinian state, that state has some capabilities that are pretty significant. You can never be sure what those intentions, the intentions of that state are going to be over time. Right? So you tend to fear that other state. The second reason that fear is so prevalent in the international system is because there's no higher authority to turn to when you get in trouble. When you dial 911 in the international system, you know who's at the other end? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody's at the other end. So you tend to be very nervous. If Germany turns out to be the Germany of 1914 or the Germany in 1939, there's nobody who's going to come to your rescue. So there's fear. That level of fear varies from case to case. I don't want to say that everybody lives in a high state of fear, but it's always there, fear. Second, you quickly understand that the international system is a self-help system. I like to say God helps those who help themselves in international politics. You do not want to depend on anybody else unless you absolutely have to. You want to be able to defend yourself because you can never be certain what the intentions of other states are. And the third form of behavior that really matters is that a result of this fear, and as a result of the fact that it's a self-help system, states quickly figure out that the best way to survive, and remember, survival is your principal goal in international politics. The best way to survive is, to put it in colloquial terms, to be the biggest and baddest dude on the block to be the most powerful state in the system. Because if you are very powerful, nobody fools around with you. Now you Americans in the audience don't appreciate this at all because you just take it for granted that you live in such a big and powerful country. But how many of you go to bed at night worrying about Canada or Mexico invading the United States? The answer is nobody does. And the reason is very simple. We are so powerful that those countries wouldn't dare think about attacking us. So the name of the game in an anarchic system, system where there's no higher authority and you can't be certain about intentions, is to be very powerful. By the way, this basic logic applied during prohibition and it applies with regard to the drug wars today. If you're dealing in drugs, you bring lots of firepower with you when you make a deal because you can't be certain that the other person won't screw you in the deal. And if the other person screws you, you can't call your lawyer, you can't call the police. That's another way of saying there's no 911. So what do you do? You bring guns to get the point across. This is why, of course, Milton Friedman wanted to legalize drugs, to take the violence out of drug dealing, right? But it was basic realist logic that was at the core of that story. So again, the name of the game is to be really powerful. 
Now, what exactly does it mean to be very powerful? And this is important. Many Americans think that we can be a global hegemon, that we can dominate the entire globe. I have never believed that, and I believe, in fact, we've gotten ourselves into a lot of trouble over the past 20 years because we've tried to be a global hegemon. My view is that the best you can do is, number one, be a hegemon in your region of the world, and number two, make sure that there is no hegemon in another region of the world. If you're the United States, this means you want to be the hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. You want to be in a situation where you're surrounded by neighbors on the north, like Canada, Mexico, Cuba, the Dominican Republic on the south, and by fish on the east and the west. <laughs> it's an ideal situation. You want to be the hegemon in your region of the world. And the other thing you want is to make sure that no other country, whether it's Germany, the Soviet Union, Napoleonic France, or Japan, or China and Asia, is a hegemon in its region of the world. Now the question you want to ask yourself is, why is John saying that somebody else establishing hegemony in their region of the world is bad for the United States? The reason is, if you're a hegemon in your region of the world, you are then free to roam. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that the United States is roaming all over God's little green acre, sticking its nose in everybody's business, projecting power here, there, and everywhere, building bases in every nook and cranny of the world? It's because we have no security problems in the Western Hemisphere, and we are free to roam all around the globe. Now, that's good for the United States, but the question you have to ask yourself as an American is, do you want a situation where China is free to roam, i.e., roam into your neighborhood? The answer, of course, is no. Because as I told you, the best way to survive in the international system is to be the dominant power, the dominant power in your neighborhood. What you want is a situation in Europe where Germany has to worry about France, the Soviet Union, and Britain. It has to keep its eye on the neighborhood, and therefore it's not free to roam the way you are free to roam. So in terms of my theory, my basic argument is that in an anarchic world, a world with no higher authority, where states have offensive capabilities, and you can never be sure about intentions, the best way to survive, there's the fourth assumption, the best way to survive is to be a regional hegemon, number one, and two, make sure that there is no, to put it in Pentagonese, peer competitor, i.e., <laughs> i.e., another regional hegemon, okay? That's my theory. Now, second part of the talk, let me give you a synoptic version of my view of American foreign policy. As you know, when we got our independence in 1783, the United States was comprised of 13 measly colonies strung out along the Atlantic seaboard. What happened over roughly the next 70 years is that the United States marched across the continent and created a very powerful state. We murdered huge numbers of Native Americans. We stole their land. We took what is today the southwest of the United States from Mexico in a war of aggression. We had our gun sights on Canada throughout the 19th century. Indeed, we invaded Canada in 1812 with the thought that we would incorporate it into the United States. The Canadians worried throughout the first half of the 19th century that we would pay them a return visit. The reason that Ottawa is the capital of Canada and not Toronto is they expected us to pay them a return visit and they didn't want their capital too close to the border. So they moved it further north. 
We had our gun sights on the Caribbean and areas to our south. And the only thing that prevented us from taking more territory to the south was the slavery issue. Northern states did not want more slaveholding states in the Union. And as you all know, the sugar industry in the Caribbean was labor intensive, even more labor intensive than cotton and tobacco. And therefore, there were huge numbers of slaves in the Caribbean. And that prevented us from going further south. We had a voracious appetite. There is no country in modern history that has been as successful at conquest as the United States of America in the 19th century. But that was only one part of the story. The other part of the story was that we had these Europeans operating in our hemisphere. We had the British Empire, we had the Spanish Empire, we had the French Empire. Well, you remember old President James Monroe. In 1823, he enunciated the Monroe Doctrine. He basically told the Europeans that they were in the hemisphere now. We were not strong enough to throw them out. We would eventually throw them out. And once we threw them out, they were not welcome back. This was our hemisphere, and we intended to run it. That's the Monroe Doctrine. By 1898, with the Spanish-American War, that task had been accomplished. By 1900, the United States was clearly a regional hegemon, the first regional hegemon in modern history. This did not happen by accident. The founding fathers and their successors were well aware of the strategic imperatives of one, conquering huge swaths of territory in North America, making sure that that American state never broke apart, as it nearly did during the American Civil War, and number three, running the Europeans out of the hemisphere and keeping them out of the hemisphere. Many of us are old enough to remember when the Cubans used to come, I mean, excuse me, the Soviets used to monkey around in the hemisphere during the Cold War. It used to drive us crazy. We would get furious. Who do these people think they are coming into our hemisphere? It's just unacceptable. It's basic strategic logic at play. Now, second part of the story is that the United States does not tolerate peer competitors. Well, there were no peer competitors in the 19th century. Uh, there were four potential peer competitors in the 20th century. Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union. The United States played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. We intervened in World War I in April 1917, at a time when it looked like Germany might win that war and dominate Europe. We went to war against Japan and Germany in World War II. We basically defeated Japan by ourselves. Soviet Union did most of the heavy lifting vis-a-vis -vis Nazi Germany, but the British and the Americans helped defeat the Germans. And then during the Cold War, we played the key role, of course, in containing the Soviet Union and then helping usher it down the toilet bowl in the period between 1989 and 1991. And if you remember when the Cold War was over with, there was defense guidance from the Pentagon that was leaked. This was during the George H.W. Bush administration that said we are now the most powerful state on the planet and we intend to stay that way. This is highly, highly usual, not highly unusual, highly usual behavior by the United States. The United States wants to be the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere and it wants to make sure it has no peer competitor. That's my basic view of American foreign policy over time. Now, what about China? My argument is that China is going to imitate the United States. China is going to try to dominate Asia and is going to try and push the United States out of Asia. I'm not saying that it will succeed, because as I'll make clear in a minute, we will resist. But that will be their goal. And the question you have to ask yourself is, does that make sense? Well, let me ask you this. If you are Chinese and you have two choices, one, you can have a China that is 10 times more powerful than Japan, or you can have a Japan that's two times more powerful than China. Do you think it matters from a Chinese point of view? You think that matters? You better believe it matters. It matters enormously. China understands full well 
what happened to it when it was weak. Chinese history from roughly 1850 to 1950, terribly sad story because they were weak and they had neighbors, i.e. the Japanese, and then they had the Europeans and the Americans as well to deal with, and China got carved up. We had things like the open door policy that we imposed on them and so forth and so on. So the Chinese understand full well, you want to be very powerful. If you're China, you're surrounded by Russia, India, Japan. You think about the balance of power. Don't you think that the Chinese want to make sure that they are by far the most powerful country in Asia? Now, this is not for the purposes of going on a rampage. I want to be very clear here. I'm not making the argument that the Chinese are naturally aggressive, that they want to go on a rampage because they want to conquer people and ruin their lives. That's not my argument. My argument is that the best way to survive in a system where there's no higher authority that sits above you is to make sure that you are by far the most powerful state in the neighborhood. You want Canada and Mexico as your neighbors. You do not want Japan, and you do not want Russia as a neighbor. Now, let's talk about the Monroe Doctrine. As I said to you before, we have a Monroe Doctrine. And we do not like the idea of any great powers coming into our hemisphere. This is why we don't want China to have the freedom to roam. Well, don't you think the Chinese should want their own Monroe Doctrine? When I was a little boy, my mother always taught me what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If it's good for us to have a Monroe Doctrine, if we don't want great powers wandering into our neighborhood, why should the Chinese want great powers wandering into their neighborhood? You don't think it bothers the Chinese that we run aircraft carrier battle groups and aircraft up and down their coastline? You don't think it bothers the Chinese that we have bases with Marines and soldiers right near, right near their homeland? They don't like that at all. Don't you think the Chinese have a deep-seated interest in pushing us, the Americans, as far away from their coast as possible? I think they do. I think they'll behave just the way we do. And I think, again, because that's the best way to survive in the international system. Now, what are the Americans going to do? We, I told you what the theory is, and we have a rich record that you can look at. Look at how we behaved in the 20th century towards Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union. And you all know that last year, the Obama administration talked about pivoting to Asia. Why do you think the Obama administration is pivoting to Asia? It's pivoting to Asia because everybody in Asia, this includes all of China's neighbors, are very nervous about China. They're very nervous. And the Americans are getting very nervous. So we're pivoting to Asia. Why are we pivoting to Asia? For the purposes of containing China, just like we contain the Soviet Union. Just like we worked to make sure that Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union didn't dominate either Europe or Asia, or Eurasia, as we used to call it during the Cold War. Right? So you could see it happening all over again. We do not tolerate peer competitors. And we are a ruthless country. Make no doubt about it. What about China's neighbors? You can already see evidence of the balancing coalition beginning to form. Balancing coalition will include South Korea, it'll include Japan, it'll include Vietnam, it'll include Singapore, it'll include India, and it'll include Russia. If you take any two of those countries and go home and Google them, Google India and Japan, and you'll see that over the past few years, the Indians and the Japanese have been jumping into bed with each other. The Vietnamese, you all remember the Vietnam War, right? All of a sudden, we're good friends with the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese would like us to have a naval base in their country. This is really amazing. <laughs> but then again, it's not really amazing. The Vietnamese are really scared of the Chinese. They're much more scared of the Chinese than they are of us. So you can see the balancing coalition. Now, the real problem that you face here, and this is very depressing, but it's the way international politics work, 
networks. The real problem is that anything that we do for defensive purposes looks to be offensive in nature to the Chinese. We think it's containment, but they think it's encirclement. You see, this is what we call the security dilemma. The security dilemma is that it's hard to distinguish between offense and defense. And what we do for defensive purposes, they will interpret as offensive. Go home tonight, either take out the New York Times or go online and look at the New York Times. Secretary of Defense Panetta is in China and he's trying to assure the Chinese that our pivot to Asia is not containment and that it's not aimed at China. But the Chinese, as you can imagine, just don't see it that way. So what's gonna happen over the next few years, and again, this is my theory, what's gonna happen over the next few years is that you're gonna to put together a balancing coalition or an alliance in Asia. I gave you the countries. The relations between those countries is gonna get tighter. Their relations with the United States is gonna get tighter. And we're gonna to go to great lengths to try and keep the Chinese where they are today. The Chinese, on the other hand, as I said to you before, are gonna to wanna to create a situation where they are by far the most powerful state in Asia. And number two, they're gonna to wanna to push the Americans as far away as possible. And of course, we're gonna resist. And anything that the Chinese do, just watch the Pentagon over the next 20 years on this front. Anything the Chinese do that they think is designed to defend themselves will be interpreted by us as offensive in nature. And again, the importance of intentions. When somebody is building up military capabilities, capabilities, right, that give them offensive power, and you cannot tell what their intentions are, for sure, you invariably assume worst case. Okay? So this is what's gonna happen with the United States and China. This is why. Frank talked about the book that I wrote. It's entitled The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. This is basically my argument, that this is a tragic situation. Uh, I feel no antipathy whatsoever towards the Chinese. I've been to China a number of times. Uh, and actually, I feel intellectually more at home in China than I do in the United States. Uh, oftentimes, when I speak in China, I say to the audience, it's good to be back among my people. Uh, and what I mean by that is there are many realists in the audience. There are many people in the audience who are sympathetic to my way of thinking about the world. And I am intellectually very comfortable there. Although culturally, I feel like I am on another planet because I can't even recognize my own name uh, when it's written in Chinese, much speak any of the language. Uh, but uh, so I have no animosity whatsoever towards the Chinese, and I wish I could figure out a way to solve this problem. But there is no way to solve this problem. This is the tragedy of great power politics. Now let me conclude very briefly by saying that what I have done here tonight is laid out my view as to what is going to happen if China continues to rise by relying on a theory. Remember I said to you, this is a theoretical exercise. But it's very important, uh, as some of the IR scholars in the crowd can tell you, that to understand that theories are imperfect instruments and they're sometimes wrong. And this is true of my theory. As much as it pains me to admit it, my theory is sometimes wrong. And all I would say is, let's hope that in this case, my theory is wrong. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, Professor uh, Wersheimer will recognize your questions and repeat them as well. Sure. Sir? His point was that in 1945, someone said that he loved Germany so much that uh, 
he was glad that there were two of them. Uh, and is this the attitude that many of China's neighbors have towards China? Uh, I don't know if that is explicitly their thinking about the matter, but I think implicitly that is how most Asians now think about Chinese military might. This is a very interesting question. I often say to students, let's assume that it's 1919. World War I has just ended. And you have to think of what the peace treaty is going to look like. And the problem that you face is that Russia has been devastated by the war and is now the Soviet Union and is militarily remarkably weak. France has been devastated by the war. Britain has been hurt very badly by the war. And although Germany has been hurt, it has all this latent power, it has all these people, all this uh, human capital, all this m potential military might. What do you do with Germany? And I often say to students that when you think about it, probably the only thing you can do is cut it up into about five or six different pieces, right? Because Otherwise, it's going to come back for a second run. And of course, that's what happens in 1939. Uh, and how do we solve the German problem? Have you ever thought about how we solved the German problem? To get back to this gentleman's point, we solved it in 1945 by cutting it in half. And not surprisingly, after 1989, when the Cold War ended and Germany was reunified, everybody in the neighborhood was very nervous. And that's why we pushed forward European integration. You know all this trouble with the EU today. European integration was designed in good part to deal with the fact that Germany was back together again. It's the most populous country in Europe, has a great deal of latent power, and how do you deal with it, right? Now, in Asia, you're in a very different situation because you don't have the EU, you don't have the Americans in a situation in Asia like they are in Europe. Uh, so I'm sure that there are lots of Asians who are beginning to think that it might not be a bad idea if you had two Chinas or three Chinas. And they'll even begin to think about whether or not uh, economic growth in China is an unalloyed good. Sir. Uh, his point was, how do I think about economic power? I, I didn't say much about it. I focused almost exclusively on military power. And he pointed out that if you look at Chinese behavior today, it's quite clear, given their interests in places like the Middle East and Africa, that they're very interested in importing lots of oil and gas to fuel their economy so they can grow and grow and grow. Let me make a number of points. First of all, I believe that economic power is the foundation of military power. Uh, the two principal ingredients of great power status are number one, a large population, and number two, lots of wealth. And the reason we care about China so much today is because it has a large population and it looks like it's gonna have a huge amount of wealth. Okay, so economic power matters greatly. And it was only time constraints that prevented me from uh, emphasizing that point. And you do wanna remember that my caveat that I started with was that I was assuming that China would continue to grow economically and become a giant Hong Kong, which I think illustrates my point. Second point that you make is that the Chinese don't seem very interested in fighting wars or building powerful military forces at this point in time. They're much more interested in economic growth. I think his point is absolutely correct, and I think it's the smart policy from China's point of view. This is not the time for China to throw its weight around and pick fights with Japan or the Philippines or the Vietnamese. If China were smart, and I think the Chinese are trying to do this, they would talk very softly, they would constantly emphasize the importance of the international community, international institutions, that they're a responsible stakeholder, uh, yada, 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 and not give their neighbors or the United States cause for concern. Uh, so I think that your description of what they're doing is correct uh, with some qualifications, uh, and I think it is the smart strategy. Bob. 
this is one of my favorite questions, and it goes like this. Uh, where in Asia should we expect to see a conflict between either China and its neighbors or China and the United States? What are the potential conflict situations? Now, before I get to the specifics of it, let me make a general point comparing Asia to the Cold War. During the Cold War, we worried about a U.S.-Soviet conflict that was centered on Central Europe. This was where NATO and the Warsaw Pact engaged in a conventional war and maybe even a nuclear war. It looked like World War III with nuclear weapons. That was the principal contingency that we planned for. It would have been an utterly catastrophic conflict. It would have made World War II look like children's play. And that's saying something. Therefore, it was almost impossible to get a war going in Europe when we used to run war games during the Cold War. You just could not get a war going in Central Europe because everybody <laughs> understood what the consequences would be. Again, World War III, probably with nuclear weapons. So it was a remarkably stable situation because paradoxically it involves such a horrible conflict. Asia has a fundamentally different geography, and this gets at Bob's question. There's no central front. There are a series of places where you can have a small war that might escalate. One is this present crisis involving the Japanese and the Chinese over the Senkaku Islands. That's what the Japanese call them. The Chinese call them the Diaoyu Islands, right? Uh, I think it's unlikely, but I think it's possible that China and Japan could end up shooting at each other over the next month. This is a very dangerous situation. Then there's the South China Sea, where there are significant disputes between the Chinese on one hand, the Vietnamese, the Filipinos, and a number of other countries, including the United States, about how to deal with that problem of who owns the South China Sea or who doesn't own the South China Sea. So that's another big problem. Korea is another problem. What happens if North Korea melts down and the South Koreans move north? The last time we, meaning the Americans, crossed the 38th parallel, and you understand we're joined at the hip with the South Koreans, the Chinese came in to the Korean War. Most people don't realize this, but between 1950 and 1953, which were the years of the Korean War, we did not fight against the North Koreans. We fought against the Chinese. And they came in when we crossed the 38th parallel because we were heading up to the Yalu River, which is their border. So if North Korea melts down and there's the potential for a unified Korea, which will be allied with the United States and put the United States right on China's border, the potential for trouble is very, very real. So there's Korea, there's the islands involving Japan and China, there's the South China Sea, then there's Taiwan, right? Uh, Taiwan is a very tricky case. Uh, for those of you who haven't talked to any Chinese as to how they think about Taiwan, boy, it is an issue that people feel really passionate about. And you can tell unlikely but plausible scenarios about how that one spins out of control. And you notice in a lot of these conflicts, not only are we talking about small wars, we're talking about wars in the water, right? So I think the likelihood of war is greater the likelihood of war is greater there than it was during the Cold War because those particular conflict scenarios would be much less catastrophic or would not be catastrophic in the way that uh, the war in uh, the World War III in Europe would have been. Sir. His question was that if you look at what happened in the run-up to World War II, it's quite clear that the Roosevelt administration uh, cut off the flow of oil to Japan and was basically strangling Japan. And as a result, the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor. 
and we ended up in World War II. And he was saying, do I think that that scenario has any relevance for the Middle East today? And he was not talking, if I'm correct, about Iran, where of course we have sanctions that look a lot like the sanctions we had on Japan before World War II. But he was hypothesizing a situation where the United States might try and cut off the flow of oil to China in the future the way we did with Japan uh, before World War II. Is that fair to say? Okay. Uh, first of all, just a few words on the run-up to World War II. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do believe that Roosevelt uh, effectively forced the Japanese to attack us at Pearl Harbor. I think he knew full well what he was doing. Uh, and I think it was the back door to getting into a war against Germany. I do not believe that Roosevelt was interested in fighting the Japanese, who were not that powerful, and who were bogged down in China at the time. Uh, much the way we're bogged down in Afghanistan now, and we're bogged down in Vietnam when I was young. The Chinese had the Japanese uh, in, in a quagmire. And uh, I believe that what Roosevelt was trying to do was Roosevelt was trying to get the Japanese to attack us. My friend Mark Trachtenberg, his historian, has written on this. For anybody who's interested, I can give you the, uh, the site on what to read. But it's a fascinating story. But it is a case where, you know, cutting off the flow of oil precipitated a war. Now, with regard to China, a couple points. One is you can cut off somebody's oil to precipitate a war or to get them to back off and stop behaving aggressively. In other words, if China were to begin to act aggressively uh, with regard to the South China Sea, one could imagine the United States threatening to cut off oil to get the Chinese to not behave aggressively. It would be a very different goal than was the case with the Japanese before World War II. So you don't necessarily have to threaten to cut off oil to promote a war. It could be to prevent aggressive behavior. Having said that, I do not believe that we will ever do that. And the reason is, I think, the only scenario under which we would cut off Chinese oil would be a World War III-like situation. And I don't see that happening. Uh, I, I'm much more concerned about the small conflicts that we talked about before. I find it hard to imagine, I could be wrong, but I find it hard to imagine the United States threatening uh, and then actually cutting off the flow of oil uh, to a country like China. We could do that with Iran today because Iran is not China 20, 30 years down the road. Remember, that's the scenario we're talking about. We're talking about a situation where you're dealing with a much more powerful China than we have today and threatening to cut off that China's oil is running a serious risk of starting a world war, and I don't think that we will do that. So I don't worry much about that scenario. Uh, his question, which is a very, very important one, is that if you look at China and you take into account that the fact that it has, let's say, four times the population of the United States, if it has a per capita GNP that looks anything like the per capita GNP of the United States, this is a country that will be, let's say, three times more powerful than the United States. It will have three times the gross national product of the United States. Let's say it only has two times the gross national product of the United States. The Soviet Union at its height, I think at the most, had one-third the gross national product of the United States. And you know how much we worried about the Soviet Union. What Richard is saying, can you imagine how powerful China will be if it turns itself into a giant Hong Kong? I think you're absolutely correct. And let me go back to geography here. When you think about the U.S.-China competition that I'm hypothesizing here, they're basically 
two geographical areas in which it plays itself out. One is in the Western Pacific. This is the Korea, Japan, Taiwan, South China Sea area. The second is in the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. The gentleman in the rear asked me the question about the Persian Gulf, right? China and the Persian Gulf. Remember, China has to come through the South China Sea, through the Straits of Malacca, underneath India, into the Middle East. We hold, and I believe will hold, all the cards in the Indian Ocean and in the Arabian Sea. I think that's where China is not going to be able to challenge us in any meaningful way. I think where the scenario you're describing comes into play is in Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia, the Western Pacific. And I think a good case can be made that if China grows the way you were talking about, and it is a real possibility, the game's over for us. It's just too big, too powerful, and we can't do anything. There's a RAND study you can Google, by the way. It's an unclassified RAND study that basically says Taiwan is indefensible by 2019. It's, it's just we can't defend Taiwan by 2019. Remember, China, just to go back to Richard's description, we're talking about a country that's got four times the population of the United States in this scenario and has more wealth than the United States, and we're playing the game in their backyard. It's their backyard, 8,000 miles from the United States, right? It is a really tough situation for us. And that's why you have to sort of wonder what happens to Japan. If Rand has a study that says we can't defend Taiwan, what does that say about Korea? What does that say about Japan? Because they're basically in a geographical situation akin to the one that Taiwan is in. Not completely, but close, right? You start thinking about aircraft carriers, you think we're going to be able to get aircraft carriers anywhere near the Chinese mainland? Aircraft anywhere near the Chinese mainland? If we have airfields, right, they'll have enough missiles to destroy those airfields very, very quickly. So I think one, one can make an argument that we will have to accept Chinese hegemony in Asia because they're just so big and so powerful we can't stop them, right? Because uh, we, in this scenario, will have never seen a potential peer competitor of that size uh, and, and th with, with those kinds of capabilities. So I, I think that that's a real possibility. Thank you uh, very much, Frank, for I, I was going to say that, that, uh, that the very valuable can, can be uh, also very enjoyable. Uh, however, that last comment <laughs> was a bit of a damper on that, that, that conclusion. But it's been an absolutely marvelous evening. We're in your debt. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you.